Well, thank you all for coming out this morning. It is a great pleasure to uh, share the experience of spaceflight with those folks that uh, make it happen. If it wasn't for all the efforts of people around the NASA centers and here at JSC that support our missions, none of this could occur. And we're going to show you a film today followed by some slides. But before we do that, I'd like to introduce the uh, crew members one more time. And one crew member is not here today. That's uh, Pedro Duque. He was selected to become an astronaut candidate in the next NASA class later this summer, and he is back in Spain preparing to move here permanently. Uh, down here on the front row, we have our other alternate payload specialist, Dr. Luca Urbani from Italy. Luca? <laughs> and we trained as a crew of nine, and for those not familiar with alternate payload specialist roles, they are prepared to step in and fill the shoes of one of the payload specialists up until the last minute. So they went through all the training on all the medical baseline data collection. Uh, and then once the uh, mission lifted off, uh, took up roles similar to a CAPCOM at the Payload Operations Center in Marshall. Uh, I'd like to uh, begin introducing the crew. At the uh, far end of the table here is the pilot, Kevin Kriegel. He was on his second mission. Next to Kevin is Dr. Chuck Brady a former Navy flight surgeon on his first flight. Next to me on my left is Dr. Bob Thirsk from the Canadian Space Agency, flying as payload specialist number two. On my right is Lieutenant Colonel Susan Helms. She was mission specialist number two, which is our flight engineer and also our payload commander, a very challenging role. Next to Susan is our PhD in microgravity, Jean-Jacques Favier from CNES, the Canadian I'm sorry, the uh, French Space Agency. And uh, this was Jean-Jacques' first flight. Uh, his family has been living at Huntsville, so he was very familiar with uh, Marshall Space Flight Center's role in not only this mission, but other microgravity science missions. And at the end of the table is our first NASA Doctor of Veterinary and Medicine to fly in space, and that's Rick Linehan, also on his first flight. Without any further ado, we'd like to go ahead and begin the uh, video. If we could bring the lights down and roll the video. And parts of the video we will narrate, other portions include some of the intercom that was recorded during ascent. Here we are suiting up at the Kennedy Space Center for our launch on June 20th. Again, Kevin Kriegel, the uh, pilot, waving to his family. Jean-Jacques Favier from France is very eager to get into space. Susan Helms, all pressure checked and ready to begin her third Space flight. And the alien here is uh, Dr. Rick Lenahan, our veterinarian. And Dr. Chuck Brady, also eager to get into space for his first time. And from Canada, Dr. Bob Thirsk. The launch uh, morning schedule is quite quick paced. No sooner had we suited up when it was time to head out to uh, the launch pad, and uh, the van would take us out there. During this walkout, we were thrilled to see some of our friends and and colleagues who had gotten up early that morning to wish us all well as we were heading off on our mission. And waiting for us at the launch pad was our beloved Columbia, and uh, at this point it seemed like it was a living creature as it hissed and fumed and groaned, and it seemed as eager as we were to, to get ready for the launch. The crew uh, was greeted at the launch pad on the, on the gantry by the closeout crew who helped us put on our harnesses and our parachutes and check out our, our equipment before we got inside Columbia. The strapping in procedure uh, is a, quite a busy and highly choreographed affair, and uh, it's also a bit of a, an emotional affair as, as well. And for a first time flyer such as myself, I found that my thoughts uh, went to friends and, and family, to the emergency procedures that I was going to have to uh, perform in the event of an emergency, and about this wonderful adventure I was heading off on. It was really nice for me to strap in in the mid deck at the same time that Tom Hendricks, uh, a three time flyer, was strapping in the flight deck. If Tom thought this was a safe thing to do, then I thought it was as well. <laughs> and these wonderful views you have of the strapping in procedure are courtesy of a, a mini portable well, camcorder. Oh, 
okay, so I went down. Two and a half one. A little bit higher, Max Q. It's just absolutely fantastic to see the be in space and see this great piece of American technology come off the external tank. Uh, it was really difficult for Rick and I to focus on getting uh, pictures of this because here we saw the earth and land masses and the oceans floating beneath us. But uh, the external tank uh, just did a super job and uh, would perform greatly. This is a, a mission that had dual objectives. It was a microgravity mission and a life science mission combined together, but the, the focus of the very first day, right after we got into space, was to capture the life science uh, data for documenting the adaption process. So without any further ado, as soon as we desuited, people were working on experiments, which is probably a, a first in the shuttle program, as quickly as we did. Here you see Bob on one of our life science facilities. It's a dynamometer. And uh, what it's meant to do is help measure both the static and dynamic performance of the musculoskeletal system. Uh, we had several PI investigative teams that were part of this major experiment. And uh, here you see some of the activities taking place. Yeah, that's uh, me strapped into the TVD knob being electrically stimulated involuntarily by a device <laughs> which uh, measures muscle contraction. Here's Chuck on the arm uh, lever. And uh, we're measuring torque output and muscle strength uh, and degradation over the 17 days of the flight on the uh, torque velocity uh, dynamometer. And Chuck here is uh, going through the different uh, protocols. You can see the IBM ThinkPad up there on his right hand. And uh, he's following those. And that interfaces with software in the TVD. Jean-Jacques is uh, holding a hand grip dynamometer, and he is performing various protocols uh, that he is reading on the ThinkPad screen up there in front of him. And uh, they are anywhere from following torque curves to uh, producing various contractions anywhere from 10 to 100% on the hand grip. And all this uh, will be compared to uh, ground-based data when we get back, when we are back now, actually, and uh, look at changes in muscle physiology. That's me again, and I am on ALFI, the uh, astronaut lung function experiment. And I'm about to uh, get on there and uh, start uh, blowing into this tube. And it's measuring gaseous exchange in the lungs. And we're comparing uh, pulmonary physiology on orbit uh, to ground-based studies. And right there, I'm interfacing with the uh, keyboard unit and reading the uh, LEDs and uh, following the flow, the, uh, flow parameters up there on the screen. And also, uh, we used ALFI uh, with exercise. Uh, we did uh, resting PFTs. Uh, here's a picture of Jean-Jacques with as many watches on and uh, the uh, magic mask, and he has just gotten off the ergometer, and he's going on to Alfie right now to uh, determine if there are any changes uh, pre- and uh, post-exercise. Here's Chuck with the Olympic torch, and uh, <laughs> Chuck is hooked up to uh, Alfie and the ergometer right now simultaneously performing the exercises, and it's uh, measuring his pulmonary output. And here's the rest of the crew offering uh, the, the, to cheer Chuck on and sharing the Olympic moment with the torch. <laughs> Now, uh, that torch was later taken down by the orbiter crew and walked around the orbiter after we landed. We had uh, another study. It was not relative to the lung function or the musculoskeletal studies that we have already talked about. But we also were looking at the vestibular system, the neurovestibular system. Uh, specifically on this experiment, the, the goal here is to try to capture what happens to 
eye and head movements and posture movements when the inner ear becomes confused about what's up and what's down. Without the effect of gravity, your inner ear doesn't really understand uh, which way it's heading relative to the earth. And so when you remove that effect, the question is, how does the inner ear then translate to the eyes and head how to move? And so we had a number of experiments. You can see some of them in progress here where we were doing very disciplined head and eye movements. And uh, likewise, we did eye movements with and without uh, knowledge of what was going on in the immediate environment. And by comparing this relative to what was captured in pre and post flight, uh, we hope to better understand how that whole inner ear eye postural integrated system works together. And of course, an application for this is, among other things, a study of space motion sickness, because we know that that's got an influence on how people react in space to that effect. The award for the uh, oddest looking LMS experiment goes to the torso rotation experiment. Uh, this uh, investigation also measures how the vestibular apparatus, or our inner ear, uh, adapts to the weightless environment. We also hope to come up with a, a cause for this space motion sickness problem, which afflicts about half of all astronauts during the first two or three days of space flight. Here in the mid-deck, uh, Jean-Jacques and I have just donned uh, the equipment, which includes accelerometer packages on the top of our head and also on our back, and we're performing a, a strange-looking dance, which is actually important to calibrate uh, the equipment. Uh, since it's the only experiment on our flight that comes from Canada, I thought it appropriate on one of the data collection days to wear my Team Canada hockey jersey. We hope also that uh, the results of this experiment will help improve treatment programs for people that suffer from motion sickness in settings on the ground. Well, this is the lace and sleepwear here. Uh, you're seeing uh, four of us come out of our bunks in the morning. This is a study looking at the circadian rhythms and sleep patterns. And this is the first time that astronauts were actually had their brain waves measured at night during six nights on four subjects. Uh, and you see us coming out of there. We're really a fashion statement here, as you'll see in just a moment. But uh, Tom's getting us all up, and we're going to line up here in just a second with all our sleep uh, equipment on. We think we're going to get really great data from this. We're looking at long duration space flight and hopefully we'll be able to uh, help people rest better and be more efficient, both in space and here on the ground. Of course, it's uh, also important to try and quantify the changes in performance. And on this flight, we flew a small laptop computer, which we would uh, practice with a few times before flight, during flight, and then post-flight. And we could see the changes in our memory capabilities and in our hand-eye coordination. This mission was a life science mission, but also a microgravity science mission. And uh, we had uh, several uh, fields of investigations, including uh, fluid physics. Here we see the uh, fluid uh, physics um, experiment called the BDPU for uh, bubble drop and particle unit. Uh, each uh, PI had a special container and we had to load in this uh, uh, optical bench, and we had to make uh, some uh, uh, critical uh, optimization before uh, getting the hand to, uh, to the ground and to the PI. These experiments worked very well, except one day we had a little problem that Kevin and myself uh, and Susan are trying to fix, uh, a shortcut in the, uh, in the um, uh, connector. But uh, when uh, we uh, got that fixed, uh, we were able to get very nice uh, views of uh, boiling in this uh, particular experiment or uh, convection driven by uh, capillary forces like uh, for this bubble in another experiment. And we tried to get the best uh, quiet conditions for these critical phases. Another important experiment was a material science uh, project, uh, a furnace, in which we uh, elaborated different kind of uh, specimens, uh, alloy, uh, aluminum alloy, for instance, as well as semiconductors. So we tried to get the best environment, a thermal environment, to study the kind of structure we can expect to get in space. And as you can see here, uh, sometimes it's uh, easier to work upside down to uh, get uh, accurate uh, positioning of uh, the uh, cartridge inside the furnace. And uh, Susan uh, looked very comfortable doing that. You can see that the space lab is very busy with activities and a lot of experiments. We also were doing some uh, experiments on the flight deck. This is the voice command system. It's a voice activated system for the payload bay cameras. And Tom and myself were working on this experiment and just seeing how well it uh, performed on orbit. Uh, we also got great views of outside the Earth 
Uh, we had a full moon, and it was uh, setting as it sets and goes through the atmosphere. It actually uh, turned blue, so we had a blue moon, and on orbit, we had a real blue moon, which is a second full moon in a, in a month. We thought we'd be fairly clever, and, and uh, we uh, videoed this down to Mission Control Center, but they were on top of us, and they had the song to play when we were videoing this down. <laughs> One of our best passes was early in the morning. Uh, we had a nice pass uh, above uh, med the Mediterranean Sea, uh, Europe, and uh, Spain here. Uh, we were able to see uh, our hometowns. Uh, this one was uh, Spain and Madrid, a hometown of uh, Pedro Duque, uh, our uh, alternate. Then we had uh, some of these beautiful islands. Uh, south of the uh, coast of France that we uh, saw uh, sometimes and it was not so cloudy. And uh, we continued uh, above uh, Italy uh, and Greece and it was a very uh, nice award in the morning to wake up early just to see that. We also had some uh, marvelous passes over the United States. Uh, you may recall that during the end of June, it was absolutely clear over most of uh, North America. And this is one scene here of us uh, saying goodbye to California, uh, currently over Nevada, New Mexico. There's Lake Mead uh, near Las Vegas, nearly in the center of the picture. And uh, one of the current events that happened while we were on orbit were the wildfires in the Grand Canyon area. And you can actually see those in the bottom left of the picture at this time. Uh, coming into the field of view just before we head over into Mexico on this particular pass. As you can see, it was quite impressive from space. Just absolutely fantastic to travel from 39 degrees north to 39 degrees south. And uh, this is a view of the Appalachians, the Great Smoky Mountains from Tennessee to North Carolina. Now we're getting ready to come home. I don't think anyone's wanted to come home, but this is a view inside as we're preparing for entry. And as a rookie, I can't begin to tell you just what a spectacular light show it was. I was really glad there were three veterans on the flight deck with me because I felt like the whole front end of the orbiter was coming on fire. As you can see, looking out the back, there's just awesome uh, light show that's going on. And in just a second, we'll see uh, the lights reflecting off of Tom and uh, Kevin in front and illuminating fully uh, in a darkened cabin Susan's face here. Just an absolutely spectacular show as we reached entry. You saw videos of the launch, but we also had that small camera where videos out uh, the front uh, were over the uh, panhandle of Florida. If you look in the middle of the picture, it's kind of cloudy, but you can actually see the coast of the Fort Walton Beach, Pensacola area as we come to land at the Kennedy Space Center. It was an overcast day. We had uh, clouds at about 20,000 feet. We're at the heading alignment cone. Uh, Tom's in a right-hand turn uh, trying to line up on Kennedy Space Center. Runway 33, we go uh, through the clouds, and this is looking out my window. This is what I saw on the entry day. We can see the rivers of the Kennedy Space Center as we make the turn. Uh, coming around the, the heading alignment cone, we're doing about 300 miles per hour, and we roll out about six miles from the runway at 12,000 feet, pointing 20 degrees, nose low. Fairly steep approach. Tom's lined up right on the numbers uh, for our landing there on that morning a couple of weeks ago. Of course, the entry flight control team had gotten us uh, to this point with a great effort by some of the folks here in the room with us today. Here we are at 2,000 feet, beginning the uh, gentle pullout from that steep uh, dive to approach the runway, using the lights to the left of the runway to achieve a one and a half degree approach. Kevin puts the wheels down about 10 seconds before touchdown, and the airspeed is bleeding from about 300 knots down to a uh, target of 205 at touchdown. And we're uh, intending to touch down about here on the black marks. You can see that's uh, about where we touched down. So the numbers worked out well. Uh, the pre-planned numbers at 195. Kevin pushes two buttons, which deploys the drag chute. I lower the nose to the runway. And then we can use the nose wheel steering system on the orbiter, much like an airliner, to uh, track the center line, which you see here. It also has brakes like an airliner, so we're slowing it with the brakes at uh, about 60 knots, Kevin punches another button which releases the drag chute so it doesn't drape down over the engines after we stop and we continue braking until we come to a complete stop. And that's the end of the flight portion of the mission, but some of the most crucial data still had to be collected as these four payload crew members readapted to gravity. So we very efficiently, with the help of the folks here in Mission Control, egressed the vehicle, 
they began their data takes, and I think you can see from this that uh, we were very pleased with the 17-day flight. And we'll transition now to the slides. The STS-78 mission links past with present through a crew patch influenced by Pacific Northwest Native American art. Central to the design is the Space Shuttle Columbia, whose shape evokes the image of the eagle, an icon of power and prestige and a national symbol of the United States. The eagle's feathers, representing both peace and friendship, symbolize the spirit of international unity on STS-78. An orbit surrounding the mission number recalls the traditional NASA emblem. The Life Sciences and Microgravity Space Lab, or LMS, is housed in Columbia's payload bay and is depicted in a manner reminiscent of totem art. The pulsating sun, a symbol of life, displays three crystals representing STS-78's three microgravity materials processing facilities. The constellation Delphinus recalls the dolphin, friend of sea explorers, each star representing one member of STS-78's international crew, including our alternate payload specialist Pedro Duque and Luca Urbani. The Olympic colored thrust rings at the base of Columbia signify the five continents of Earth united in global cooperation for the advance, advancement of all humankind. And this is a photo of the ET after separation, about a third of the way through the sequence. And uh, it's about to uh, re-enter, and it has started its tumble already. And if you'll uh, look up near the top of the ET, you can see kind of a bullseye like Mars, gray and black. And that is the characteristic burn scar of the SRBs. And this was taken with a Nikon F4 and a 300 millimeter lens with a doubler on it. Uh, kind of looked like a small bazooka, actually, when you got it out there. So uh, you can imagine uh, Chuck, Chuck and I were both up there uh, getting the cameras out with Susan's help and uh, maneuvering ourselves into the back window to take this picture. And uh, I think we got some good ones. Well, this is the shuttle amateur radio experiment. What a delight this was. Uh, each crew member got a chance to talk with school kids all around the world. And uh, many of these school kids had worked for uh, six months or up to a year even preparing, working in science and math, studying the orbital tra trajectories of the shuttle, getting ready with antennas and so forth to get a chance to talk with us on board. The real credit goes to our SARX team here uh, on site, those guys and uh, ladies that work so hard on this program. We got a chance to talk with many people around the world and just the feel of someone being, uh, it, whether it's an internet question or KCA or our shuttle amateur radio experiment, gets a chance for people to feel like they're inside the shuttle and this is what this business is all about. There was another experiment that we had on our flight that wasn't seen in the film, and that's the uh, plant growth facility. I know there are a number of people here interested in how plants grow in space. Uh, we continue to do research in that area, and Jean-Jacques and I were the two people that were designated to monitor and harvest these plants after they had been growing in space for about a week and a half to two weeks. What you see here is documentation of the chambers. We had five chambers, uh, four of which were exposed to the cabin air, and one of which was totally self-contained. In the next slide, you can see uh, one of the chambers that was exposed to the cabin air, and uh, the needles are quite sparse. Two of the plants are bent over on purpose to see if they can grow reactive tissue at the bend while they're in microgravity uh, versus the ones that aren't bent at the middle. Uh, but when we took out the one that had not been exposed to the cabin air, it was like a lush tropical forest in there. And when you thought about the fact that this is what it looks like when it's exposed to cabin air, it really made all of us pause for a minute wonder what was in our air. Uh, I, I'm sure we're interested in hearing the, the scientific results of this experiment. And this is a picture of, uh, uh, well, we're taking blood from each other. And believe it or not, uh, throughout this 17-day mission, uh, the payload crew all donated about 120 cc's of blood per person. Uh, Chuck is there with a tourniquet on his arm, and that's me about to uh, place a butterfly catheter into his uh, vein to uh, get a morning fasting blood sample. And uh, in, many, in many instances, we were actually taking blood samples pre and post TVD exercise. So you saw that uh, uh, earlier in the, uh, in the slides there. And uh, we were measuring hormone levels and uh, other physiologic functions with the blood. And uh, to my knowledge, uh, between the SLS series of flights, uh, this is uh, one, of, one of the big successes here was that we managed to get every blood sample. And uh, so far, from what we've heard from the PIs, uh, they've all been very good, and uh, they're getting the data they need. We saw, we recognized some folks who they call the KCA uh, equipment, and really all it is is a video uh, teleconferencing system. Um, we use the KU antenna, 
on the orbiter's uh, capability to uplink video files. And we had two-way transmissions. The age of Dick Tracy is here with that little camera on the laptop computer. We can see the people in Mission Control Center. And they can see that. It turned out to really help us out when we did one of the in-flight maintenance works on the uh, bubble experiment. Having the opportunity to see uh, from, the, from space uh, uh, his hometown is uh, for each of us a uh, very good sa satisfaction. Here you have the south part of France uh, with the, on the left uh, bottom part uh, the uh, beginning of the French Riviera, uh, Marseille and going to uh, the uh, Italian border. You can see also the Alps, uh, these um, very nice mountains on the middle uh, right with uh, some uh, snow on top of the glaciers. And just in the middle, the uh, Grenoble Valley. Grenoble is my hometown town and is also uh, the uh, capital of the goat cheese. Another good shot of uh, an important city for, for us. Uh, this is Madrid in Spain, just in the middle of the Iberian uh, Peninsula. Uh, it's not very easy to uh, see this city because uh, of the colors uh, uh, which match ac actually the um, uh, landscape around it. But uh, we are sure that Madrid is just in the middle of this uh, picture here. And uh, this was an important shot for uh, Pedro Duque, our alternate. Everyone recognizes the, that this is the boot of Italy, and in particular, uh, along the spine of Italy near the east coast are the Apennine Mountains. And on the west coast, about halfway down the boot, is the city of Rome. And a little bit further down from that is the famous Bay of Naples. Uh, to the left is the island of Sicily, which in this very rare occasion during our mission was cloud covered. Um, Italy is a very important uh, uh, country, a contributor to the International Space Program. And I got up every morning to look at this view, thinking about uh, Italy being the cradle of Western civilization centuries ago, and about today its high-tech uh, space program. And also, uh, Italy is the home of uh, Luca Urbani, our alternate uh, payload specialist, who is a member of our crew. We considered Luca and uh, Pedro as uh, members of our crew because not only of their training, but also of the uh, payload uh, development and procedures development they contributed to our flight. And uh, it's very likely that Luca will have his own shuttle flight in the coming years. Moving on to the United States and uh, the rest of North America, this is a picture of the Cascade Range with the diamonds of the mountains, uh, rarely seen from space without cloud cover. Uh, just a orient you up to the very top of the picture, you're, you're basically looking at uh, the south tip of uh, British Columbia, including Vancouver Island, which is where Bob is from. He's from Victoria. Uh, the, the mountain at the very top there is Mount Rainier, and Chuck is from the Seattle area, just nearby that area. Uh, just to the south of Mount Rainier, to the little bit to the right is Mount Adams, and then a little bit further down, there's a little white blotch with some uh, brownish gray just to the north, that's Mount St. Helens. And uh, it looks like it's been, had its cap blown off, and of course that's exactly what happened in 1980. And then the residue from the volcanic eruption, you can still see from space here, if you look at the gray area just to the north of that. Uh, the next mountain down is near my hometown of Portland, Oregon. Uh, so we've crossed over the Columbia River into the state of Oregon, and that's Mount Hood. And then further down near the bottom of the picture is Mount Jefferson, and at the very bottom are the Three Sisters, which is in central Oregon. We also had some outstanding opportunities uh, to take pictures of Denver and Colorado Springs. If you look at this picture, the, the green is the Rampart Range uh, south of Denver, and uh, the brown that's to the left of the picture near the bottom is Pikes Peak. And of course, I know you can see very clearly in the center of the picture at the Air Force Academy, which is the alma mater of myself, Tom, and Kevin, uh, like a second home. So uh, we, were, we were surprised how clearly we could see details. Uh, the Academy's got several unique landmarks. And while we were up there, we had the opportunity to, to give a welcome to the incoming class of basic cadets uh, that happened to be planned for graduation in the year 2000. So it was quite a landmark. As uh, Jean-Jacques mentioned, uh, we all got to uh, view our homes from space. This is uh, where my roots uh, are. It's uh, Lake Erie. 
uh, is at the uh, top right hand corner. That's the western end of the lake and at that very uh, corner uh, of the lake is Toledo, Ohio, named after Toledo, Spain. I uh, grew up in a small town called Woodville just outside there. So this was the first out of four flights that I'd been far enough north to see Ohio, which you see in the center part of the screen, which Michigan up in the upper half. We also have uh, Detroit in the field of view uh, near the upper right hand corner. And then the landmass just across the river is Windsor, Ontario. Could you tell from my accent, uh, this is my hometown? <laughs> uh, this is the longest island in the United States. The second one is Whidbey Island, where Chuck is from. Uh, very cleverly, we named it Long Island. This is where I grew up. Uh, in the south side, just north of the beaches, uh, in the middle of the picture is my hometown of uh, Amityville, Long Island. And Amityville, uh, Long Island has about seven million of uh, this country's people living there. Uh, this is a picture of the Washington, D.C. area, our nation's capital. You can see the coastline on the right side of the view. You can see the Potomac River is coming in uh, on the left side, the central uh, part of the view, and then winds down through Washington, D.C. in the very center of the frame, and then exits near the bottom left-hand corner. Uh, we had the opportunity of celebrating the independence of uh, three nations of our crew members during or shortly after the flight. We celebrated Canada Day on the 1st of July. We obviously celebrated Independence Day on the 4th of July for the U.S. And then just last weekend, we had the pleasure of celebrating the French national holiday on the 14th of July. This is an infrared picture of the same area, not directly uh, from the same location. This is looking straight down on Washington, D.C. With infrared film, the vegetation shows up green. I'm sorry, shows up red. As you can see, the river shows up more blue or, or green as it winds through Washington, D.C. And the city itself shows up very gray or white colored. And some of the other white blotches you see are the tops of clouds. And on the very left-hand side of the slide, you can see a Dulles Airport very distinctly. So infrared photography uh, can make man-made structures very distinct. Atlanta, Georgia, home of the 1996 Summer Olympics. And just as the athletes are gathering this week from all around the world in the spirit of international goodwill and cooperation, our crew and our mission were particularly blessed in having uh, representatives from five nations and from four separate space agencies. And we feel like that's a great forerunner of the International Space Station and the cooperation and goodwill that that uh, forebodes. And as you can tell from uh, this scene, uh, we enjoyed our 17 days in space immensely. Uh, we did not look forward to returning. We were happy to uh, stay on orbit a few more days, gathering the data for the folks here on the ground. But again, as I mentioned at the introduction, none of this would be possible without the tremendous efforts that people here at the Johnson Space Center, the Kennedy Space Center, and in our case, the dedicated folks at the Marshall Space Flight Center that directed the uh, science and data gathering during this mission. So on behalf of the crew, we would like to thank each of you for your individual efforts in making STS-78 the success that it was. Thank you. <laughs>